Okay, so it looked like the recording is working again. So let, let's continue on with this lecture. Oh, I was going to scream if it didn't work. Okay, so if we do a little bit of substitution and put this in here for the velocity, we get lambda equals h over m times the square root of 2k over m. And if you want to get fancy, you can write this as h over m over the square root of m times the square root of 2k. So we're going to end up with three of these kind of equations. So this is the first one. Okay, so here's number one. So then on the second one, we're going to start with the same idea that lambda equals h over momentum. Then if we take and solve this for velocity, we get h over m lambda. And then, which is kind of cool, and then we can go, oh, okay, well then if kinetic energy equals one-half m times velocity squared, so we get h squared over lambda squared, m squared, and we can cancel out one of the m's, and we get one-half h squared over lambda squared m. Okay, so there is the second one. And then on the third one, we're going to go kinetic energy equals one-half mv squared, and if we solve momentum, we get, mo for velocity, we get momentum divided by mass. So we get one-half m times momentum squared over mass squared, and we get momentum squared over 2m. So all three of these equations, okay, are just handy ones to have. So... Like, if you know the momentum of an electron and you want to calculate the kinetic energy of it, knowing this, it just solves you, it saves you the hassle of taking the momentum and going, oh, then I'll find the velocity and then I'll plug that into one-half mv squared. So this is just going to make it simpler and you can go directly into momentum squared over 2m without going through and finding the velocity and then putting it into this equation. So these are just handy dandy little equations to have. Okay, so here's the next big equation. It's what's known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it's, let me write it out, delta x change in momentum greater than or equal to Planck's constant over 4 pi. So here's the deal. So what this basically says is that this is a certain value. So what this means is that you either have an uncertainty in the position. Like let's say, for example, you have a small delta x. What that means is that you know exactly where this particle is, okay? Like it's an electron or a proton. So, so if this is a really small number, that means that you have a big uncertainty in terms of its momentum. And that momentum is mass times velocity. So the uncertainty generally doesn't come in the mass. The uncertainty usually comes in the momentum. So a lot of times you'll see this written as delta x times m delta v greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Okay? So here, here's kind of the best analogy that I can give. Is that let's say that you know a soccer ball is traveling around a field, okay? And you're standing in the field and you're blindfolded. So this works out better if you can actually visualize this. So imagine I'm, imagine I'm in front of the room and I'm blindfolded. And I know that there's a soccer ball moving somewhere in the room. And the only thing I can do is kick it. So imagine me, I'm in front of the room, I'm blindfolded, and I'm randomly kicking my leg. So I know a lot about the velocity of the ball. I know it's traveling at, say, 10 meters per second, okay? I know it has a certain amount of mass. At any point, I can, I'm going to know what its momentum vector is. Now but I don't know where it is, okay? So what happens then 
is let's say that I walk up and I start kicking and I happen to kick the ball at this point. Well, at this point, I have know where the ball is. It was right there. But unfortunately then, because I've kicked it, that's going to screw up my velocity. So now I don't know where it's going to be traveling after that. So by finding it, I have ruined the my knowledge of the velocity by the act of finding it. So one of the great stories that kind of spins out of this, and this is all happening about the same time, is the story of Schrodinger's cat. So if you've never read about Schrodinger's cat, here's a brief introduction. There's whole books written on Schrodinger's cat. So according to the legend of Schrodinger's cat, inside a box, okay, there's a cat, hence the term Schrodinger's cat. And there's a radioactive sample that, could, that can undergo a decay. And if it undergoes a decay, it will release a particle that will break a vial of poison and gas. And unfortunately, the cat dies. So, but there's no way of knowing what's happening inside the box. So this is what Schrodinger did with his work with wave functions. He came up with a wave function that was called psi. And so psi describes the wave probability of an electron moving around the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. It's brutal math if you ever do it. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's brutal, brutal math. So this is what's known as the wave function. So the idea being is that this is somewhat similar to this idea of momentum and of, of position. So the cat's either alive or dead. It can exist in one of two states, but we don't know which one. So the live or dead is like the wave function. So the only way that you can, it's called collapsing the wave function, is to open up the box. When you open up the box, one of two things is going to happen. Either the cat is going to be alive and it's going to scamper off and it's never going to participate in another science experiment again. Or the cat is dead and it's not going to participate in another science experiment again either. So either way, the cat's not going to be a part of the story later on. So, but by opening the box, this is called collapsing the wave function. So the same thing is true of this uncertainty with the position and the momentum. It's, it's a wave function that you are going to collapse. So there's that equation. So here's the last one that we need to talk about. And this is K equals three halves KBT. This is known as Boltzmann's constant. And this is on your equation sheet. And it is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. This is a temperature that's in Kelvin. So here's the ramifications of this. This is the kinetic energy. Okay. So this is the kinetic energy typically of like a gas. And this comes out of like a statistical model. And so this is a constant. So obviously as your temperature goes up, your kinetic energy goes up. Now here's where this plays into the idea of kinetic energy. So since kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So let's say that you have hydrogen gas and you have carbon dioxide gas, and they're both at the same temperature. What that means is these particles, and this is the kinetic energy of a particle, is going to be the same for the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide. Well, the hydrogen is going to have a small mass, so it's going to be moving really, really fast. The carbon dioxide has a much bigger mass, but it's going to be moving slower so that both of these particles end up with the same kinetic energy. So that's all that. So hopefully this is recorded. Uh, and this has been horribly, horribly frustrating trying to make this whole thing work. But here's a quick summary. You have De Broglie. Basically, he says particles move with waves, and that's a product of Planck's constant divided by mv. And then from that, then you can solve this for, do some substitutions into here, and you can get these three equations that relate a wavelength to Planck's constant and kinetic energy and momentum. And then you have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says you can either know the position or the momentum with a high degree of precision, but not both at the same time. Okay, uh, so this is going to show up as two recordings. And if the second one doesn't work, I don't know what I'm going to do.
Tchau. Thank